American members from the Naples region were thriving in New York by the late 1920s, mainly due to bootlegging. Profits from breweries were enormous. Each barrel of beer cost less than $5 to produce and netted about $36 upon delivery to a speakeasy. The illegal untaxed income from supplying whiskey and other hard spirits was even greater. In the competition between ethnic rivals, the Sicilian-Italian bootleggers lacked the political influence of the Irish underworld. The largely Irish police force gave them an advantage in corrupting cops. And the Jewish gangsters were almost equal in numbers to the Italians. But the Italian mobsters had a distinct asset. They were recognized by their rivals as better disciplined, more vicious, and more deadly whenever fights erupted over territorial control and customers. New York's largest Italian gang in the mid-1920s was based in East Harlem and headed by Giuseppe Joe Masseria, a middle-aged Sicilian immigrant. Short and corpulent, Masseria's puffy cheeks and small, narrow eyes earned him the nickname The Chinese. Masseria, however, dubbed himself Joe the Boss, and was the first to use that designation for the head of an American mafia family, instead of the traditional Sicilian title, Father. Masseria's ascension rested on a violent, blood-soaked record. He led a gang that killed more than thirty opponents in battles over bootlegging territories and illegal gambling operations. His favorite expression for ordering the execution of a rival was instructing an underling to take that stone from my shoe. Despite his unathletic, portly physique, Masseria possessed an uncanny agility when dodging bullets and outrunning and escaping assassins in street ambushes and gunfights. His carnal appetite was as gross as his quest for power. He would sit down several times a day to huge meals, wolfing down three plates of pasta, just as a side dish. Masseria's trencherman habits and atrocious table manners, food often splattered from his mouth as he harangued dining companions, gave rise to another nickname from his detractors, Joe the Glutton. Masseria's success stemmed partly from a keen eye for talent to run and protect his rackets. Three of his brightest young recruits, who had emigrated as boys to America, were Salvatore Lucagna, Francesco Castiglia, and Gaetano Lucchese. Lucagna would become Charles Lucky Luciano. Castiglia would change his baptismal name to Frank Costello, and Lucchese would be better known as Tommy Three Finger Brown. Later, the trio would attain eminence in the American Mafia's pantheon. In 1925, the Castello Marese clan was rejuvenated by the arrival of Salvatore Maranzano, another illegal immigrant driven out of Sicily by the Mussolini Mori juggernaut. A well-established mafioso with the honorific title Don Turido, Maranzano, then in his early forties, was a devoted defender of mafia tradition. One of the clan's best warriors in the old country, he came to America with a small fortune and quickly branched out into bootlegging. No small-time operator, Maranzano built quality whiskey stills in Pennsylvania and upstate New York and took the twenty-year-old Joe Bonanno under his wing. Bonanno handpicked a squad of armed marksmen to safeguard Maranzano's whiskey trucks, often camouflaged as milk tankers from rival hijackers. Unlike Joe the Boss Masseria, Maranzano fancied himself a sophisticated, educated European. Although he had sparse command of English, Maranzano bragged about being literate in Latin and Greek, and in his basso profundo Sicilian dialect, delighted in lecturing his unschooled, barely literate minions on classical literature and the virtues of his idol, Julius Caesar. As a cover to conduct his bootlegging business, Maranzano set up a company in Little Italy that supposedly was involved in export and import trade. There was a harsher side to Maranzano's business and personality that he revealed in a monologue to young Bonanno. He cautioned his protege that hunting animals was relatively simple, but taking the life of another man demanded courage and caution. 
When you aim at a man, your hands shake, your eyes twitch, your heart flutters, your mind interferes, Bonanno recalled Maranzano advising him. If possible, you should always touch the body with your gun to make sure the man is dead. Man is the hardest animal to kill. If he gets away, he will come back to kill you. Those words soon proved to be prophetic. In 1930, other members of the Castella Maresi Borgata turned to Maranzano for guidance and leadership when Masseria demanded $10,000 payoffs as tributes, recognizing his assumed position as Joe the Boss of all New York mafiosi. Masseria also began dispatching hitmen against recalcitrant Castella Marese soldiers. The firebrand Maranzano refused to submit to Masseria or acknowledge his supremacy thereby igniting an unprecedented large-scale conflict between the area's two largest borgatas. As casualties mounted, each side sought reinforcements from the other New York gangs and from mafiosi in other cities. In the Sicilian-Italian underworld, the mob carnage was spoken of as the Castella Marese War. Aware that they were prime ambush targets, Masseria and Maranzano surrounded themselves with bodyguards, traveling around town in convoys of armor-plated cars. Maranzano relied on a custom-built Cadillac with metal-plated sides and bulletproof windows. He shared the rear seat with a machine gun mounted on a swivel to fire out the windows. For backup weapons in close combat, he carried two large-caliber handguns and a dagger. Although he worked as a top lieutenant for Masseria, 29-year-old Lucky Luciano worried that the shootouts, with cadavers and wounded men sprawled on streets, attracted unwelcome notoriety to the Borgata gangs. Even worse, the fighting compelled the police to launch investigations that could endanger the smooth stream of loot flowing to him and his pals. From the start, Luciano had opposed the tyrannical thrust for absolute control and power by Joe the Boss fearing that it would end in death and chaos for the main participants. Before the war broke out, Luciano had become increasingly frustrated by Masseria's refusal to adopt his ideas for modernizing and expanding their rackets. Content with the easy money from bootlegging and protection shakedowns, Masseria brushed off Luciano's proposals to cash in on new ventures. Luciano's business ideas included streamlining international bootlegging by cooperating with other Italian and with non-Italian gangs to bring in greater quantities of booze and eliminate hijackings. He knew that such cooperation would also prevent interference from the law by guaranteeing that more law enforcement personnel would be adequately bribed. Additionally, Luciano wanted to expand the areas of labor racketeering gambling, and prostitution. Many of these activities would require temporary or permanent partnerships with Jewish and Irish gangsters. The distrustful Masseria, reluctant to accept alliances even with rival Sicilian and Italian mobsters whom he knew, vetoed any deals with Jewish or Irish hoods. Representing an emerging generation of English-speaking mafiosi who had been raised in America, Luciano grew increasingly contemptuous of the erratic, archaic methods of Masseria and his older immigrant counterparts. Luciano and his closest confederates referred disparagingly to Masseria and his ilk as mustache peats and greasers. After eighteen months of combat and with no end in sight to the Castella Marese War, Luciano intervened by double-crossing Masseria. According to Joe Bonanno, who served as Maranzano's wartime chief of staff. At a clandestine meeting with Maranzano, Luciano offered to halt the hostilities by eliminating Masseria and assuming control of the dead boss's gang. In exchange, Maranzano would call off his hitmen, recognize Luciano as an equivalent boss, and peace would reign between the two factions. Armed with the secret pact, Luciano moved swiftly. He set up Masseria, inviting him to Coney Island for a lavish lobster lunch, a card game, and a conference at one of Joe the Boss's favorite trotterias, the Nuovo Villa Tamaro, where he would feel safe. 
The meeting on April 15, 1931, was ostensibly to find a way to ambush Maranzano. Masseria drove to the luncheon date in his personal armored car with one-inch thick bulletproof windows and with three bodyguards. Before dessert arrived, Luciano left for the toilet. Mysteriously, Masseria's bodyguards vanished from the restaurant as four of Luciano's killers suddenly appeared and riddled Joe the boss with a volley of gunfire. The New York Daily News reported, with melodramatic exaggeration, that Masseria died with the ace of spades, the death card, clutched in a bejeweled paw. Picked up for questioning by detectives, Luciano could offer no theory about a motive for the murder. Unfortunately, he added, he had no clue about the gunman, because he was washing his hands and had seen nothing. With Masseria out of the way, Maranzano was hailed as a conquering hero by the surviving Castellamarese clan. Luciano got his reward by taking over Masseria's large gang, and Maranzano gave his blessings to new leaders of three smaller borgatas, whom he considered trustworthy allies. Maranzano, however, had a surprise in store for Luciano. Signaling his presumed dominance, Maranzano summoned Chicago's Al Capone and mafia leaders from the rest of the country to a meeting in a resort hotel in tiny Wappingers Falls, 75 miles from Times Square, to inform them of New York's new power lineup. The major implication of the meeting was clear. Mananzano had crowned himself as the highest-ranked leader in New York, and because of the city's prominence as the mafia's emerging American pull star, he expected to be recognized as superior to all bosses in the country. Maranzano, in effect, had declared himself capo di tutti capi, boss of bosses. In New York, he began issuing organizational decrees to the Castellamarese mafiosi and to the other borgatas. Recalling his admiration for Caesar, he wanted the families modeled loosely on the military chain of command of a Roman legion. Towering above all others, a father, or boss, or representante, would govern with unquestioned authority. His main assistant, or executive officer, was the sottocapo, underboss. Crews or street units, decini, would be formed, consisting of ten or more inducted soldiers or button men. Each crew would be led by a capo decina, capo, or captain appointed by the boss, and the units would be the family's workhorses for all illegal operations. Maranzano further mandated that mafia rules, which were inviolable in Sicily, be imposed on all the New York clans. His fundamental precepts, all carrying the death penalty if ignored, were unquestioned obedience to the father or boss and his designated officers no physical assaults or insults against a fellow mafioso, a ban on desiring or courting the wife or sweetheart of another mafioso, and, most important, obeying Omerta, the code of secrecy. Mananzano's high-handed moves provoked Luciano, who now reassessed him as more backward in his thinking than Masseria had been. Not only had Mananzano reneged on their deal for equality in New York, but he was thirsting for power throughout the country. From his trusted crony, Tommy Three-Finger Brown Lucchese, Luciano got wind of more alarming news. The duplicitous Lucchese had cozied up to Maranzano and his top lieutenants, and learned that Maranzano had marked Luciano for a machine-gun assassination by the Irish cutthroat Vincent Mad Dog Cole. Befitting his new grandeur, Maranzano had moved his headquarters from Little Italy to an elegant suite of offices and the building atop Grand Central Terminal. Lucchese's spies tipped off Luciano that Maranzano was having tax troubles and expected that his phony export-import business records would be scrutinized by the Internal Revenue Service. In anticipation of an audit, Maranzano had instructed his bodyguards to be unarmed while in his office to ensure there would be no arrests for gun violations. Acting quickly to catch Maranzano off guard, Luciano decided that the Grand Central Office would be his best chance. On September 10, 1931, 
Lucchese showed up unannounced at the office for a courtesy call on Maranzano. Minutes later, a group of men swept in, announcing they were IRS agents. None appeared to be Sicilian or Italian, and neither Maranzano nor his bodyguards suspected they were hired killers. Before the bodyguards could react, the hitmen got the drop on them, and at gunpoint lined them up along with Lucchese and a female secretary, with their faces pressed to the wall. Lucchese identified Maranzano with a head movement, and a gunman nudged Maranzano into his private office. There were sounds of a struggle followed by a barrage of gunfire. Five months after his arch-foe, Joe the Boss, had been annihilated, Maranzano lay dead, his body torn by bullets and knife wounds. Organized crime historians are uncertain if Luciano had schemed from the start to remove both Masseria and Maranzano as dinosaurs. Antiquated obstacles to the Mafia's progress and realignment. A thin, slightly built, dark-haired man with an impassive, pockmarked face. Luciano came to New York as a boy of nine, from a village near Palermo. A school dropout at fourteen, within a decade he compiled an arrest record for armed robbery, gun possession, assault, grand larceny, gambling, and possession of narcotics. Remarkably, most of the charges were dropped, and except for an eight-month sentence, Luciano avoided any long jail time. A prison psychiatrist aptly analyzed him as highly intelligent, but an aggressive, egocentric, antisocial type. As a teenager, Luciano held only one honest job, as a five-dollar-a-week shipping clerk in a hat factory. He quit the day after he won $244 in a dice game, but used his experience at the factory to hide heroin that he transported and sold in hat boxes. At age 18, he admitted to a probation officer that he found regular work unsuitable for his personality. I never was a crumb, and if I had to be a crumb, I would rather be dead, he told the interviewing officer. In Lucky's lexicon, a crumb was an average person who slaved at a dull or laborious job, squirreled away money, and never indulged in extravagant pleasures. By the time he was in his twenties, Luciano had been tagged with the nickname Lucky, but it is unclear whether he acquired it for his gambling exploits, or surviving gun and knife attacks, or from American mispronunciations of his Italian surname. His closest call came in 1929, when he was abducted, beaten, and strung up by his hands from a beam in a Staten Island warehouse. True to his calling, Luciano refused to tell the police who had taken him for a ride and the reason for it. The episode left a jagged scar on his chin. On the Lower East Side, as a wild teenager before joining Masseria's gang, Luciano cemented alliances with Jewish gangsters that would endure for a lifetime. Charlie Lucky's closest Jewish criminal companions were the shrewd Meyer Lansky and Lansky's volatile colleague, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. There was little doubt among New York's mafiosi that Luciano had engineered Maranzano's murder, and that the hit team had been mustered by his Jewish confederates. Luciano, however, circulated the message that he had indisputable evidence that the power-mad Maranzano, without cause, had been preparing to kill him, and therefore the hit was justifiable under mafia rules. The Castellamarese clan presented the only danger to Luciano of a new war, or an assassination attempt to avenge their chief's death. But Luciano's self-defense claim was readily accepted, even by Maranzano's staunchest protege, Joe Bonanno. Reflecting on Maranzano's imperious behavior after winning a brutal struggle, Bonanno decided that his patron had been an astute warlord, but unable to adapt to the culture and tactics of the new Americanized breed. Despite six years in America, Maranzano spoke little English, and was unable to communicate with younger criminals or comprehend their street talk and slang. Maranzano was old-world Sicilian in temperament and style, Bonanno explained in his autobiography. But he didn't live in Sicily anymore. In New York, he was advisor not only to Sicilians, but to American Italians.
set for anointment as head of the Castellamarese Borgata, Bonanno saw the wisdom of Luciano's new look for the Mafia and accepted what he characterized as the path of peace. With the war between them over, Luciano and Bonanno held a conclave with the heads of three other substantial borgatas in New York, whom Luciano considered agreeable to his plans. The other bosses were Gaetano Galliano, Vincent Mangano, and Joe Profaci. Without any specific blueprint, in 1931, five mafia families had evolved from a convulsive decade. The five families would survive, under various names and leaders, into the next century. No other American city would have more than one mafia family, nor would any other borgata come close to matching the size, wealth, power, and influence of any of the New York families. Before the year ended, the New York bosses traveled to Chicago for a national conference with Al Capone, Chicago's Italian mob titan, and the leaders of more than twenty other mafia factions in the country. The great innovator Luciano explained his concepts for avoiding intrafamily and interfamily mob wars and for establishing lasting prosperity. He accepted as pragmatic Maranzano's organizational structure of crews performing the bulk of the work for the families, but added a wrinkle for the hierarchies. Besides a sotto capo, an underboss, each family regime or administration would have a consigliere, a skilled counselor or diplomat, to iron out problems inside the family and to resolve feuds with other borgatas. Luciano saw the practical wisdom of the Sicilian traditional reliance on omerta, absolute loyalty to the family, and many of the other rules and security measures that Maranzano had suggested to prevent penetration by law enforcement agents. These behavioral standards would serve as the Mafia's sacred code, its Ten Commandments. Without discussion or debate, it was universally understood by the bosses that membership throughout the country would be open only to men whose parents were both from Sicily or southern Italy. Italian heritage of only one parent would be insufficient for acceptance into a family. Bloodlines were critical factors for determining trustworthiness and for acceptance as a man of honor. The size of each family was fixed at the number of made men it had at that time with replacements allowed only for dead members. Freezing the strength of each borgata was intended to prevent surreptitious expansions to dominate other families and possibly ignite territorial conflicts. Limiting membership also was seen as a business-like means of selecting the best and most competent candidates. Luciano made it clear that mafia membership was a lifetime obligation. There were no provisions for resignation or early retirement. The only way out is in a box, Lucky emphasized. While not a written document, the Code illuminated the Mafia's fundamental guiding principle. The survival of each family and the combined National Mafia overshadowed the needs and safety of the individual mafioso. Every family was therefore obligated to maintain the organizational viability that would withstand any assault by law enforcement. The purpose of the code was to enable a family to continue functioning efficiently, even if the boss or other hierarchs were removed. The organization would be supreme, its parts replaceable. Luciano unveiled one more idea, his most striking innovation. Without precedent in the Sicilian Mafia or among Americanized gangsters, it was the creation of the Commission, the equivalent of a national board of directors that would establish general policies and regulations for all families in the country and would settle territorial and other disputes that might arise. The Commission would be the vital link between families throughout the nation, ensuring cooperation and harmony on joint criminal ventures. It would be analogous to an underworld Supreme Court, whose primary function was to prevent warfare while recognizing the sovereignty of the individual groups. Luciano and Bonanno originally wanted to name the new body the Committee for Peace, after its main purpose. But younger, American-reared mafiosi found the name too difficult to pronounce in Italian or Sicilian. 
clearly defining New York's keystone position in the Mafia's national pecking order. Luciano gave representation on the commission to all five New York families. Other members of the new body would come from Chicago and Buffalo, with the proviso that more families could be added if necessary. Chicago's selection was an obvious recognition of Capone and his gang's strength, wealth, and domination of numerous rackets in the Midwest. The boss of the Buffalo family was Stefano Magadino, another immigrant from Castellamare del Golfo. Magadino was highly respected and feared because he was a cousin of Joe Bonanno and had business ties to mafia organizations in the Midwest and in Canada. Luciano surprised the Underworld Convention by insisting that each family on the commission have a single vote, with all decisions determined by the majority. His successes in New York had elevated him into a position of unrivaled national importance, and there was little doubt that among the nation's mafia bosses, he was first among equals. There would have been no opposition if Charlie Lucky had nominated himself as the first capo di tutti capi, boss of bosses. But Luciano realized that the bloodshed in the previous decade as families fought for dominance and underworld monopolies, climaxed by the Castellamarese War, had demonstrated the futility of attempts to impose a supreme leader. Martin A. Gosh, a Hollywood movie producer, claimed that thirty years after the Chicago Conclave, Luciano reminisced about it with him in preparation for a proposed film version of Luciano's life. Gosh asserted that Luciano summarized his main purpose for the meeting with this colorful quote. I explained it to him that all the war horse shit was out. I explained to him we was in a business that had to keep moving without explosions every two minutes. Knocking guys off just because they come from a different part of Sicily, that kind of crap was giving us a bad name and we couldn't operate until it stopped. Although the substance of Gosh's conversations with Luciano was never documented elsewhere, the quotation matched accounts that investigators dug up of Luciano's goals at the session in Chicago. Cosa Nostra experts agree that all of Luciano's remodeling proposals were accepted by the nation's mob families. Luciano's game plan clearly established that the American Borgatas would never be subsidiaries or satellites of the Sicilian Mafia. Although drawing on Sicilian traditions, especially Omerta, Americans' independent mafiosi were adapting themselves to the unique social and cultural forces that existed on their continent. The Chicago secret meeting reportedly ended at the Blackstone Hotel, with Al Capone hosting a feast where the delegates, acting as if they were at a jazz-era orgy, made merry enjoying the favors of a plethora of prostitutes. Without the awareness of the nation's vast law enforcement apparatus, in 1931, an American mafia had been custom-designed for efficient plunder, and New York was its epicenter. 5. Dirty Thirties For millions of Americans, the 1930s was the paradigm of hard times, the decade of the Great Depression. Justifiably known as the Dirty Thirties, it was an era clouded by unprecedented economic impoverishment, bank failures, shuttered factories, violent strikes, abandoned farms, homeless wanderers, bread lines, and soup kitchens. At the nadir of crisis in 1931, about 15 million people almost 25% of the nation's workforce, were unemployed. The newly hatched mafia families, however, had no financial worries. The decade was the onset of unparalleled prosperity and cooperation that would extend far into the century. At the 1931 Chicago conclave of top mobsters, Lucky Luciano, the mafia's visionary criminal genius, installed the organizational foundations that each of the score of existing borgatas used to construct networks of illicit enterprises. Joe Bonanno, one of the bosses present at the creation of the modern American Mafia, was gratified by the long period of serenity that Luciano's grand scheme inaugurated. For nearly a thirty-year period after the Castellamarese War, 
No internal squabbles marred the unity of our family. And no outside interference threatened the family or me, Bonanno marveled in his autobiography. Luciano's managerial revolution was intended to build bulwarks that would protect and insulate himself and the other bosses from implication in the transgressions committed by their families. Thereby, each chieftain or godfather would reap the profits from his family's criminal activities, without risking indictment or imprisonment. Ironically, while Luciano's blueprint safeguarded most of his fellow bosses, he was the only New York mobster of his era to suffer a long prison sentence. Prohibition had been the catalyst for transforming the neighborhood gangs of the 1920s into smoothly run regional and national criminal corporations. Men like Luciano, Bonanno, and Lucchese began as small-time hoodlums and graduated as underworld leviathans. Bootlegging gave them on-the-job executive training in a dangerous environment. It taught them how to plan and run the intricate machinery necessary for producing and supplying huge quantities of beer and whiskey. Still in their twenties and thirties, this new breed of mafiosi became expert at marshalling small armies of smugglers, truckers, cargo handlers, and gunmen. The young millionaire mobsters also became adept at laundering money to dodge tax evasion problems and learned how to bribe and manipulate political and police contacts to forestall law enforcement headaches. The Chicago meeting was a success. A power structure was in place. The nation's mafia leaders tacitly agreed to assemble every five years at a national crime forum, much like a political party convention or a religious synod, to fraternize and review mutual concerns. Within the new Luciano and Bonanno families, their ranks had enlarged as a byproduct of the Castella Marese War and the need for reinforcements in a costly campaign. While the Luciano plan and the commission united all of the country's borgatas and generally recognized rules and concepts, there were regional distinctions about membership. Joe Bonanno refused to subscribe to the idea of his borgata as a melting pot for all Italians. Only men of full Sicilian heritage, he insisted, could be faithful to Cosa Nostra culture and obligations. None of the families would permit the utterance of the name Mafia to identify their organizations. The New York families adopted Cosa Nostra, the Mafia code name in Sicily. Chicago called itself The Outfit. Buffalo chose The Arm. Others, especially in New England, preferred the neutral-sounding The Office. Eventually, among mafiosi, the most popular mode for identifying a made man was the simple expression, he's connected. As the gangsters dispersed from Chicago, most of them realized that Prohibition, the lush money machine, was on its deathbed. A majority of the public and most politicians wanted to rescind the law as unenforceable, unpopular, and a corruptive influence on law enforcement agencies. The worsening depression provided another anti-prohibition argument for the new administration in 1933 of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Supporters of repeal contended that it would revive the legitimate alcohol industry and generate thousands of new jobs. In December 1933, the 21st Amendment to the Constitution was adopted, repealing the 18th Amendment that had outlawed the production and sale of alcoholic beverages. On the first night that the 13-year dry spell ended, in New York, tens of thousands of revelers poured into Times Square in a spontaneous celebration. The huge throngs required the emergency mustering of almost the entire city police force of 20,000 officers for crowd control. The five New York Mafia families were prepared for the cosmic change. Prohibition had enriched them so handsomely that they had sufficient startup money and muscle to bankroll new rackets and crimes, or to simply take over existing ones from rival ethnic Irish and Jewish gangsters. As an example of the Mafia's financial resources, movie producer Martin Gosh said that Luciano told him that his gross take from bootlegging alone in 1925 
was at least $12 million, and that after expenses, mainly for a small army of truck drivers and guards and bribes to law enforcement officials and agents, he cleared $4 million in profits. Prohibition was barely in its grave before the New York Mafia was feasting from a smorgasbord of new and expanded traditional crimes. Bookmaking, loan sharking, prostitution, narcotics trafficking, robberies, cargo hijackings, and the numbers game. Racket became the popular term for these new Mafia endeavors. The use of racket as slang to describe an underworld activity can be traced back to 18th century England. Its exact derivation is unclear, though it might be related to alternate definitions of racket, a clamor, a social excitement, dissipation, or gaiety. In the mid and late 19th century, the term came into use as a raucous private party held by Irish-American gangs in New York. To subsidize their rackets, the gang members demanded or extorted contributions from merchants and individuals, whose property and lives would otherwise be endangered. Racketeer is a totally American invention, probably coined by a newspaper reporter to describe the innovative 1930s breed of mobsters. One shakedown the post-prohibition mafiosi borrowed from the defunct Black Hand was setting up phony security companies to protect businesses from arsonists and vandals who might damage their properties. Merchants and restaurateurs who declined to sign up with these spurious watchguard services often found their windows smashed or their premises ravaged by suspicious fires. Jewish gangsters in New York had invented the art of industrial racketeering in the Garment Center, which had a large percentage of Jewish workers and sweatshop proprietors. The Jewish thugs had been invited into the industry by both sides during fierce strikes in the 1920s. They worked as strike breakers for manufacturers and were employed by some unions as guerrillas to intimidate factory owners and scabs during organizational drives. When the confrontations ended, the gangsters who had worked illegally for both sides stayed on, gaining influence in the unions and in management associations. Their alliances with union leaders gave the Jewish racketeers the power to extract payoffs from owners by threatening work stoppages and unionization drives. Alternately, the unions paid them off by allowing mob-owned companies to operate non-union shops. Some mobsters muscled into companies as secret partners, getting payoffs from the principal owners in exchange for allowing them to operate non-union shops or for guaranteeing sweetheart labor contracts if they were unionized. Lucky Luciano, the only godfather with close ties to top Jewish gangsters during Prohibition, had little difficulty in absorbing Jewish garments and her rackets into his own dominion. Jewish hoods became junior partners and vassals of Luciano in one of the city's largest and most profitable industries. According to Joe Bonanno, who shunned mergers and deals with the Jewish underworld, Luciano in the mid-1950s was the dominant mob figure in the garment industry. Luciano had extensive interests in the clothing industry, especially in the Amalgamated Clothing Workers' Union, Bonanno wrote later. Charlie Lucky offered to place Bonanno's men in important positions in the Amalgamated, which was the principal union involved in manufacturing men's and boys' clothing. Once empowered in the union, Bonanno, like Luciano, could control vital jobs, set union contractual terms, and share in kickbacks from the manufacturers. Luciano's offer was politely turned down, because Bonanno did not want to be obligated to another family. The independent-minded Bonanno had another good reason to go it alone. He had his own connections to the other vital clothing industry union, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. Like the other New York bosses, Bonanno had numerous traditional criminal activities and new front enterprises to keep him busy and affluent. He had taken over a variety of legitimate businesses, three coat manufacturing companies, a trucking company, laundries, and cheese suppliers. There was also a Joe Bonanno funeral parlor in Brooklyn that was suspected of being used to secretly dispose of victims murdered by the family. The ingenious Bonanno was said to have used specially built two-tiered or double-decker coffins 
with a secret compartment under the recorded corpse that allowed two bodies to be buried simultaneously. Income from these fronts was a handy means for warding off tax audits and justifying his above-average lifestyle. Bonanno's underlying capitalist philosophy rested on a basic theory that guided him and other bosses. Eliminate all competition. One must remember that in the economic sphere, one of the objectives of a family was to set up monopolies as far as it was possible, he explained in A Man of Honor. In addition to the garment industry, the five mafia families used strong-arm tactics and their influence in unions to control and obtain kickbacks from stevedore companies on the Brooklyn waterfront, the Fulton Fish Market, the wholesale meat and produce markets in Manhattan and Brooklyn, construction and trucking companies, and hotels and restaurants. The Sicilian-Italian gangs even forced out Jewish racketeers from their pioneering roles in the $50 million a year kosher chicken business. New York's large Jewish population and its orthodox dietary rules guaranteed a steady demand for the interrelated poultry industry. The Jewish hoods were content with simple old-fashioned protection tactics. They engaged in small shakedowns of frightened and defenseless businessmen, trying to keep their companies and their bodies intact. Inspired by Tommy Three-Finger Brown Lucchese, the Mafia had more grandiose plans. Lucchese's gunmen pushed aside their Jewish counterparts and, in what would become a classic model for industrial racketeering, established a cartel among live chicken suppliers, wholesalers, and slaughtering companies. Lucchese formed a supposed trade group, the New York Live Poultry Chamber of Commerce, and, through a combination of subtle intimidation and promises of ample profits, forced most kosher chicken businesses to join. Prices were fixed to put an end to normal competition, and each company was assigned a share of the market. In return, the company paid a fee depending on gross sales to the Mafia Front Poultry Association. Lucchese and his helpmates, of course, took a hefty cut for establishing the cartel and preventing new companies from competing in New York. The companies that kicked back part of their profits to Lucchese simply passed along the crime tax through higher prices to their customers. Within the industries they controlled, from the garment center to the waterfront, the mafiosi profited further from illegal gambling and loan sharking rings that fleeced wage earners. No competition was allowed by the five families. Jewish and Irish gangsters, who had run their own powerful Prohibition-era gangs, offered little resistance to the Mafia's drive for absolute control. Even Meyer Lansky, the most influential Jewish gangster of his time in the 1930s and 40s, needed the approval of his Mafia partners for most of his projects. Lansky accompanied Luciano to Mafia conventions, but was never allowed to sit in on discussions. Before the Mafia takeover, the undisputed Jewish criminal virtuoso of the 1920s was Arnold Rothstein. His omnibus activities included international bootlegging, labor racketeering, stock frauds, fencing stolen diamonds and bonds, narcotics trafficking, and gambling schemes. Rothstein's legendary coup was engineering the Black Sox scandal, by fixing the 1919 Baseball World Series, in which the heavily favored Chicago White Sox were defeated by the Cincinnati Reds. Known along Broadway as The Brain and The Big Bankroll, Rothstein was an unthreatening-looking figure, soft-spoken and a spiffy dresser. His authority was enforced by an entourage of brutal henchmen, and he tutored a crop of future Jewish and Italian underworld stars, including Lansky and Luciano. The charismatic Rothstein is believed to have been the inspiration for F. Scott Fitzgerald's gangster Meyer Wolfshine in The Great Gatsby. Whatever obstacles Rothstein might have created to the Mafia's takeover of New York rackets were eliminated before Prohibition ended. On the night of November 4, 1928, he was found staggering on a sidewalk in midtown Manhattan, shot in the stomach. Rothstein survived two days, but, true to his own code of omerta, refused to identify the shooter or the motive.
I'm not talking to you, a detective quoted him as saying from his hospital deathbed. You stick to your trade. I'll stick to mine. He was dead at age 46. George Wolfe, a Jewish lawyer in New York who represented Cosa Nostra and Jewish gangsters in the 1930s and 40s, had a close-up view of the new ethnic underworld relationships. The two groups have always worked in surprisingly good harmony, Wolfe commented, the Italians respecting the Jews for their financial brains, and the Jews preferring to stay quietly behind the scenes and let the Italians use the muscle needed. Mafia strength stemmed partly from the ultimate organized crime weapon, murder. At the 1931 Chicago meeting, the bosses figuratively set in concrete the rule that only mafiosi could kill mafiosi. And while they could kill outsiders, other criminals would face death for even threatening a made man. A Jewish racketeer, Michael Hellerman, warned of the danger in challenging mafia authority in matters of money. Jews, outsiders, wind up on the short end of any sit-down chaired and run by the mafia, he grumbled. Somehow, we always wound up paying, even when we were right. During Prohibition, Irish gangsters dominated many sections of New York. Their most powerful and ruthless icon was Oni Madden. Madden began his career as a predatory gunman hijacker in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood on Manhattan's rough west side. His Prohibition-era escapades glamorized him as a celebrity millionaire, with stakes in two dozen nightclubs including the acclaimed Cotton Club in Harlem. Madden's reputation for revenge and craftiness and his political influence at City Hall were so potent that even the Italian gangs stayed out of his territory. But the death of Prohibition and the rise of the Mafia persuaded Madden that he could no longer survive or compete in any sphere with the Italian gangs. In 1933, the 40-year-old Madden announced that he was retiring from New York, relocating south to Hot Springs, Arkansas. At that time, Hot Springs, a city famed for its compliant and corrupt police and public officials, was a refuge for nonviolent criminals. After his fierce battles in New York, Madden found the ambiance in Hot Springs easy pickings. He became that city's illegal gambling monarch. The Mafia had similar post-prohibition successes against their former Irish and Jewish rivals in other cities. Sizable Irish crews in Chicago and Boston, and Jewish contingents in Detroit, the Purple Gang, and Philadelphia faced two choices. They were either whacked or induced to become hired hands for specific crimes, or allowed to work as compliant bookies paying the Mafia protection money. While the New York families were solidifying their organizations in the early 1930s, law enforcement efforts against them were at best haphazard. The insulated bosses, however, took careful note of the legal trap that ensnared Alphonse Capone, a tax evasion case. Al Capone's birthplace and date of birth are uncertain. Various records indicate that he was born in the late 1890s, either in southern Italy or, more likely, in Brooklyn, where he grew up. Like many of his era's gangsters, Capone was an early school dropout and got his basic training as a battler in street gangs. Working as a bouncer in a combination bar and brothel, Capone was slashed on the left side of his face, providing him with the sinister nickname Scarface. He arrived in Chicago as an enforcer and gun-toting bodyguard, just as Prohibition and the beer wars were raging. By the mid-1920s, Capone had shot his way to the top of Chicago's gangland and was running multi-million dollar bootlegging, prostitution, and gambling enterprises. The raucous climate generated by Prohibition turned gangsters into press celebrities and rogue heroes. Capone basked in the limelight. His favorite interview statements were, I am just a businessman, giving the people what they want, and all I do is satisfy a public demand. The stout, balding Capone made no attempt to avoid cameras and attention. He relished front-row box seats at baseball games, where players queued to sign autographs for him. 
and he hosted lavish parties at Chicago hotels, and in his fourteen-room mansion on exclusive Palm Island in Florida. His conspicuousness and violence finally backfired. On St. Valentine's Day in 1929, six members of the gang of his arch-enemy, George Bugs Moran, and an innocent optometrist who had stopped by to visit, were lined up against a garage wall and machine-gunned to death. Chicago's law enforcement authorities were in Capone's pocket and made no serious effort to investigate the slaughter or any of Capone's activities. But the horrendous St. Valentine's Day massacre provoked the administration of President Herbert Hoover to pin something on the haughty Capone. Furthermore, the administration was committed to enforcing prohibition, and Capone's open defiance and his striking visibility were embarrassing and mocking. An extensive paper chase by a special Treasury Department unit barely scratched the surface of Capone's actual illicit spoils. But the squad of auditors and investigators unearthed records linking payments to him from 1924 to 1929, totaling $1,038,654, income never declared for tax purposes. Capone was defeated by diligent accountants, not by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, nor by the intrepid G-man Elliot Ness and his band of incorruptible sleuths featured in popular Hollywood and television versions of the story. Found guilty of tax evasion, Capone began serving his sentence in 1932. Suffering from advanced syphilis, he was imprisoned for seven years in the dreaded Alcatraz Penitentiary and other stringent federal prisons. Released in 1939, the once invincible Capone was a broken, pitiful invalid. He never returned to Chicago, dying in 1947 at his Florida mansion. His downfall had no impact on the New York bosses, except as a warning about tax evasion investigations. Capone's authority had been confined to the Chicago area, and his commission seat could easily be filled by one of his lieutenants. The New Yorkers also viewed Capone as a questionable believer in the Mafia's culture and its structure. They had doubts about him because he declined to comply with the ritual induction of made men into his gang, and failed to appoint capos or a consigliere. In essence, they were uncertain that he even considered himself a mafioso. To Cosa Nostra purists, Capone's outfit functioned more like a partnership than a traditional borgata, and he violated a cardinal tradition by delegating responsibilities to non-Italians. Capone made a fortune from his rackets, but his reputation among the shadowy New York godfathers was diminished by his penchant for publicity. His fame was greater than his actual influence and power. At the end, Capone's exaggerated underworld importance became a fatal liability for him. 6. Runaway Jury Al Capone's misfortunes in the early 1930s had no immediate counterpart in New York, where local and federal law enforcement authorities were either too corrupt, too indifferent, or too ignorant to disturb Mafia families. The city's newspapers, then the principal source of news and information, were equally passive about investigating and reporting the emergence of the new organized crime phenomenon. Gangsters, murders, and kidnappings made good copy during Prohibition, almost a welcome relief from the grim economic news of the Depression. For the most part, reporters and editors portrayed individual racketeers sympathetically, and Damon Runyon's colorful guys and dolls yarns about lovable rogues became the accepted universal myth about mobsters and criminals. Instead of exposing the mob's almost wide-open gambling, labor industrial racketeering, extortion protection, and prostitution activities, some influential editors and columnists hobnobbed, gambled, and drank with the underworld characters. Herbert Bayard Swope, the editor of the prestigious New York World, at one point owed his mob bookies $700,000. Walter Winchell and other nationally syndicated Broadway columnists cultivated relationships with gangsters, for gossipy tips and scoops.
Law enforcement authorities were even more negligent than the sycophantic press. A string of elected district attorneys in Manhattan, New York County, the center of the city's vice industry, never probed any of the blatant rackets. The district attorneys were usually hand-picked incompetents, designated by the Democratic Party's Tammany Hall Club, a group of party leaders who controlled nominations and elections in Manhattan, a Democratic stronghold. Since the early days of Prohibition, Tammany's leaders were on the slush fund payrolls of Italian and Jewish gang leaders to protect them from potential reform crusaders and police interference. The routine impaneling of a Manhattan grand jury in March 1935 unexpectedly provoked a law enforcement earthquake. Following his customary interest in easily solved crimes, the ineffectual Manhattan district attorney, William Copeland Dodge, instructed the jurors to concentrate on indicting his regular agenda of suspects arrested for minor felonies. Dodge's only other priority target was the absurd threat of the Red Menace, and he suggested that the jurors focus on the Communist Party newspaper, The Worker, which he felt was using the Depression to foment insurrection. A grand jury's task is to weigh evidence and to vote whether or not there is sufficient evidence to hold a defendant for trial. Normally, grand juries are easily manipulated by prosecutors, and after hearing only the prosecution's version, churn out felony indictments in assembly line fashion. But the 23 Manhattan grand jurors, led by a strong-minded member, revolted, demanding an independent investigation into the spreading rackets in the city. Their outcry was endorsed by the city's bar association and by several ministers and civic associations. The runaway jury was a hot newspaper story, and its pressure forced Governor Herbert Lehman to appoint a special prosecutor to examine the reformers' allegations. Lehman, a Democrat, selected a 33-year-old former federal prosecutor, the Republican Thomas E. Dewey. Raised in the small town of Owasso, Michigan, Dewey stayed in New York after getting a law degree at Columbia University. A three-year stint in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan turned him into a formidable prosecutor. Most of his federal cases involved bootlegging and income tax charges, and Dewey quickly exhibited a trademark courtroom talent, an uncanny memory for the tiniest detail of a crime that would trip up a hostile witness in cross-examination. Giving up a successful Wall Street practice, Dewey leaped at the prosecutorial opportunity offered by Lehman, even though it meant a huge salary cut. Unlike the apathetic Tammany Hall DAs, the aggressive Dewey didn't sit back waiting for cases to come to him. He understood how to gather evidence and had the foresight to make his objective the destruction of criminal organizations, rather than convicting low-level hoodlums. At the time of his appointment, there were virtually no restrictions on the use of telephone taps by state prosecutors in New York. And Dewey made maximum use of that tool to dig up evidence and leads. Dewey lacked precise insight into the existence of the Mafia Borgatas or their organizational structures, but he instinctively understood that he was being challenged by a new kind of criminal, the racketeer who never personally committed a murder or a hijacking or extorted a penny from a victim. The dirty work was left to henchmen, who were the ones risking arrest. To prosecute mob bosses effectively, Dewey had to overhaul a cumbersome criminal procedure law. Under an existing New York rule, a defendant could be tried only on each specific count. That meant multiple trials, even if the culprit had been indicted for 100 separate acts. With the help of lobbying by reform politicians and organizations, Dewey persuaded the legislature to authorize joinder indictments, a procedure used in federal courts that permitted a single trial on combined charges. It was a legal weapon that Dewey could employ in court to try leading gangsters on multiple counts and link them to the crimes actually committed by their flunkies. The first prominent racketeer targeted by Dewey was Dutch Schultz. Born Arthur Flegenheimer, Schultz was another ragtag criminal who cashed in on the floodgates opened by Prohibition. 
He formed a bootlegging gang, mainly of Jewish strongmen, and took over distribution of beer in the Bronx. Through terror tactics, murders, kidnappings, and torture, Schultz rivaled the Mafia in the scope of his operations and in the enmity he aroused. When Dewey became the special state prosecutor, Schultz's gang was the only non-Italian organization left in New York that was not subservient to the Mafia. Underworld Cognoscenti referred to the five Cosa Nostra families in Schultz's outfit as the Big Six. Schultz also had sound business sense. As bootlegging waned, he acquired control of a restaurant workers' union and used it to extort labor peace bribes from restaurants. Renowned spots, including Broadway's Lindy's and the Brass Rail, were compelled to bribe him in order to remain open. In his search for easy money to replace the lost bootlegging revenue, Schultz and his ferocious leg-breakers took over the numbers or policy racket in Harlem from African-American and Hispanic bankers. During Prohibition, bootlegging was so extraordinarily profitable that the various gangs looked askance at the income from numbers as chump change and had little interest in operating in primarily black neighborhoods. The racist gangsters derisively regarded numbers as the nigger pool. But tens of thousands of New Yorkers played the numbers games that paid 600 to 1 for picking three digits chosen daily from the wagering handle, the last three numbers of the total peri-mutual betting at a horse racing track. For a depression-racked population, winning the numbers was a popular fantasy, even if the wager was just a few pennies. Dutch envisioned the numbers game as an essential substitute for his vanished income from bootlegging. He consolidated scores of small-time independent numbers operators in Harlem and the Bronx. The old-timers had the choice of working and paying a generous percentage of their take to Schultz or winding up in the morgue. Schultz quickly found that his plunge into numbers was the right move. The games grossed an estimated $20 million a year in bets and there were few lucky winners to cut into Schultz's profits. Schultz's incendiary temperament probably helped eliminate opposition to his new acquisitions. If enraged, Schultz, dubbed the Dutchman in the New York underworld, would kill even in front of witnesses. J. Richard Dixie Davis, Schultz's lawyer, once remarked that the Dutchman murdered friends and enemies just as casually as if he were picking his teeth. He once ended an argument over money with one of his underlings by shoving a gun into the man's mouth and blasting his head off. When he suspected that one of his longtime trusted lieutenants, Bo Weinberg, was plotting against him with Italian mobsters, Schultz personally encased Weinberg's legs in cement and dumped him into the Hudson River while still alive. Half a century later, the barbaric slaying of Weinberg became a riveting scene in E. L. Doctorow's novel, Billy Bathgate, and in the film version. Tax indictments were seemingly the government's only strategy for convicting high-profile gangsters like Schultz. But he beat two attempts by federal prosecutors to snare him on tax evasion charges. For one trial, Schultz obtained a change of venue to the rural town of Malone, New York, where he endeared himself to the jury by bribing almost the entire community with personal gifts and charitable contributions. Once the tax problems were resolved, Schultz became aware that Dewey's first major move as special prosecutor was to cast a spotlight on him through the impaneling of a special grand jury. The investigation further unhinged him and made him more bloodthirsty. Seeking to ingratiate himself with Lucky Luciano and gain the support of the most respected mafia leader, Schultz converted to Roman Catholicism. He apparently believed that religion would bond him with Italian bosses and make him more acceptable to them as a co-equal. One of the underworld dignitaries invited to the convert's baptism was Charlie Lucky himself. More ominously, Schultz began scheming to assassinate Dewey. His men shadowed Dewey and discovered that every morning, after leaving his Manhattan East Side apartment, the prosecutor stopped to make telephone calls from a nearby pharmacy before heading to his downtown office. To avoid disturbing his sleeping wife, 
Dewey used the pharmacy's public payphone to confer with his staff on overnight developments. One or two bodyguards accompanying Dewey remained outside the drugstore. Schultz decided that the store was an ideal trap. A lone hitman, using a gun equipped with a silencer, could drill Dewey while he was seated in the booth, and then knock off the pharmacist. The early morning sidewalk and traffic noise, Schultz reckoned, would drown out the gunfire and cover the hitman's escape. With his plan worked out, Schultz offered the job to Albert Anastasia, one of the Mafia's most efficient trigger men, who had Lucky Luciano's ear. Schultz rationalized that Dewey was a menace to all the bosses, not just him, and his elimination was a priority. Anastasia lost no time in relaying the news to Luciano, who summoned an emergency meeting of the commission. The Mafia's Supreme Council unanimously vetoed Schultz's scheme. According to Joe Bonanno, the bosses considered the plot insane. They feared that slaying a prosecutor with Dewey's prestige would spark enormous public outcry against the rackets. Among the American Mafia's original leaders, there was unanimous accord that incorruptible law enforcement officials and investigators, straight arrows, were immune from underworld revenge and violence. Murdering Dewey, the bosses reasoned, would only unleash more Thomas E. Dewey's and law enforcement fury against all of them. The commission session did end with approval of a hit, but the target would be the Dutchman. Schultz had become a serious liability to the Mafia godfathers. His irrational ravings about Dewey and his unquenchable thirst for violence attracted too much attention to their own rackets. The Mafia preferred a quiet style of business. Trying to evade Dewey's scrutiny, Schultz holed up in a three-room suite at the best hotel in Newark, New Jersey. To eradicate Schultz, the commission selected the mob's star executioner, Albert Anastasia, whom Schultz had wanted to hire for the hit on Dewey. Anastasia is believed to have assigned the commission's contract to Jewish professional executioners working for the Mafia. Three armed men cornered Schultz as he was having dinner on October 23, 1935, at the Palace Chop House and Tavern in downtown Newark. In the men's room, one gunman mortally wounded Schultz. A fusillade by the trio finished off two of his bodyguards, and Otto Berman, better known along Broadway as Abadaba, the mathematical genius and accountant in charge of Dutch's financial ledgers. Schultz's death eliminated the last big-time non-mafia gang and automatically expanded Lucky Luciano's empire. Without opposition, Lucky appropriated Schultz's numbers banks and took charge of the Dutchman's restaurant shakedowns. Schultz's warnings, however, about the danger of Dewey's long reach were prescient. 7. On Lucky Lucky the mob's murder of Dutch Schultz cleared the way for Dewey's vigorous team of prosecutors and investigators to home in on another inviting quarry, Charles Lucky Luciano. Charlie Lucky, although the strongest mob dictator in 1936, was relatively unknown to the public. His last arrest and prison stretch occurred when he was a teenager, and like other New York Mafia notables, he preferred operating behind the scenes and keeping his name out of headlines. He was less discreet about his alliances with Tammany Hall leaders and socialized openly with them at major political gatherings. At the 1932 Democratic Party convention in Chicago, which nominated Franklin D. Roosevelt for the presidency, Luciano and his politically far-sighted adjutant Frank Costello accompanied the Tammany delegation. Of course, the mafiosi could not cast votes at the convention, but they were treated like royalty by the powerful Tammany leaders. Lucky shared a suite with James J. Hines, a West Side district leader, who would later be convicted of taking underworld bribes to fix police and judges in gambling cases. Costello's roommate was one of their close friends and a high-powered political connection, Albert Marinelli. Affectionately nicknamed Uncle Al by mobsters, Marinelli was the first Italian Democratic district leader in New York 
and held the pivotal post of city clerk. His job included supervising inspectors who tabulated votes in city elections. Besides having the ability to stuff ballot boxes, Marinelli was of particular help to the Mafia and other criminals, because he oversaw the selection of grand jurors. Despite Luciano's attempts to keep a low profile, Dewey's squad was aware of his high underworld rank and his political ties to the Democratic machine. The investigators were not deceived by his pretense that he made a substantial living from shooting craps, sports gambling, and bookmaking. Dewey's examiners discovered that Luciano's luxurious lifestyle could never be financed solely through bookmaking and gambling. For starters, Luciano maintained his own private plane for jaunts to Saratoga Springs, Miami, and other resorts. Dewey's detectives theorized that Luciano also kept the plane as an emergency getaway vehicle in the event of trouble. A stylish dresser, bachelor, and party animal, Lucky registered under the assumed name Charles Ross at the elegant Waldorf Astoria Hotel, where he lived year-round in 36C, a posh three-room suite. The apartment rented for $7,600 a year, the equivalent of more than $100,000 in today's money. The governor's executive order establishing Dewey's temporary office as special prosecutor specified that his main mandate was the eradication of the numbers rackets in the city. Dewey, whose stern visage and bristling black mustache were frequently pictured in newspaper stories, wasted no time in broadening his prosecutorial horizons. Trying to rally support for his gang-busting campaign, he announced through newspapers and radio broadcasts that his objectives went far beyond wiping out numbers banks. His goal, he declared, was to rid the city of what he termed industrial rackets, the mob's violent exploitation of businesses and unions that inflated prices for a hard-pressed Depression-era population. On the radio, in his mellow baritone, he appealed to the public to supply him with leads and tips. Dewey's first stabs at surveillance and background investigations of Luciano failed to turn up damaging racketeering evidence against him. Detectives and lawyers discovered that Luciano, obviously wary of wiretaps, was circumspect in his telephone conversations. Moreover, he apparently kept no records on paper. All incriminating financial details were in his head. But Dewey's agents unexpectedly came upon a lead that entangled Luciano in a vice crime. The path to Luciano began when Dewey's only woman staff member, Eunice Carter, badgered him into examining corruption inside the city's women's court. Carter suspected that there was unrestrained fixing of cases and flouting of the law among judges, lawyers, and bondsmen when prostitutes were brought before that special court. Dewey reluctantly gave tentative approval for a limited inquiry, insisting that he was more interested in industrial rackets and did not want to be portrayed as a puritanical prosecutor of fallen women and madams. To Dewey's amazement, the women's court investigation went far beyond corrupt court personnel. It led directly to Lucky's gangsters. Unlike federal statutes and court rulings that, in the 1930s, virtually prohibited government agents from installing wiretaps and bugs, New York state law permitted court-approved telephone interceptions. Mainly through wiretaps and brothels, Investigators uncovered clues that an organization referred to in the wiretapped conversations as the Combine and the Combination was in control of about 300 whorehouses in Manhattan and Brooklyn, which employed 2,000 working girls. More crucial to Dewey was the discovery that a top Luciano henchman, often seen with him, David Little Davy Batillo, was overseeing bordello operations and siphoning a huge hunk of the $12 million a year gross from organized prostitution. The investigation revealed that Italians had largely replaced Jewish gangsters as the dominant force in the brothel business, a pattern similar to the Mafia's takeover of other rackets in the city from Jewish and Irish hoodlums. In January 1936, Dewey's men simultaneously raided 80 bordellos, arresting hundreds of prostitutes, madams, and bookers 
men who helped manage the houses, recruit women, and assign them to different locations as needed. Using threats of high bail and long pretrial imprisonment, unless the suspects cooperated, Dewey's staff convinced a good number of prostitutes, madams, bookers, and pimps caught in the sweeps, to testify and dramatize the magnitude of the huge network. In addition to witnesses who implicated Luciano's lieutenants, three prostitutes claimed that they had direct knowledge of Charlie Lucky's involvement in the ring. Aware that Dewey was closing in, Luciano fled to Hot Springs, the Arkansas refuge for Oni Madden and other privileged gangsters. Dewey obtained an extradition order to bring him back on 90 counts of aiding and abetting compulsory prostitution. An Arkansas state judge complied by jailing Luciano for a hearing. Luciano, however, had well-placed friends in the easily corrupted Hot Springs government, and, after barely four hours in the lockup, he was released. His $5,000 bail had been provided by no less an official than the chief detective of Hot Springs. I may not be the most moral and upright man that lives, an indignant Luciano told reporters after learning of the charges, but I have not at any time stooped so low as to become involved in aiding prostitution. Luciano's lawyers were busy finding reasons to rescind the extradition order when Dewey's men swooped down on Hot Springs and, with the help of state troopers, rearrested the celebrity fugitive. Before Luciano's attorneys and Hot Springs officials could react, Dewey's detectives kidnapped Luciano and spirited him out of the Razorback State. The trial of Luciano and twelve co-defendants in May and June 1936 marked the first time that Dewey used his new legal weapon, joinder indictments, to link a group of defendants in a single case. Luciano, of course, was the central target. In his opening statement, Dewey gave him star billing as New York's czar of organized crime and the headman of the Combine, the prostitution racket. Dewey lined up 68 witnesses, almost all hookers, pimps, madams, bookers, and jailbirds, who admitted they had been promised lenient sentences, immunity, or probation for aiding the prosecution. Dewey's main strategy was to depict the prostitutes as desperate victims of the Depression, exploited and terrorized by the Combine's ruthless sentries. I tell you, I was afraid, a former prostitute testified. I know what the combination does to girls who talk. Plenty of girls who talked too much had their feet burned and their stomachs burned with cigarette butts and their tongues cut. Only three erstwhile prostitutes from Dewey's large clutch of witnesses provided testimony directly linking Luciano to the accusations. The most damaging allegations came from an admitted heroin addict named Cokie Flo Brown, who said she had accompanied her pimp to late-night meetings with Lucky, at which business matters were discussed. According to Cokie Flo, she heard Lucky propose a plan to franchise whorehouses, the same as the A&P. She further recalled that Luciano once pondered the idea of placing the madams on salary, instead of allowing them to take a cut from the gross proceeds. Another prostitute said she had sex several times with Lucky in his Waldorf Astoria Towers apartment, and after some sessions, overheard snatches of his conversations with co-defendants. She claimed to have listened in as Luciano gave instructions to punish an uncooperative madam by wrecking her establishment. On another occasion, she testified, Luciano had ordered a hike in prices to increase profits. A Waldorf chambermaid and a waiter identified other defendants as having often been seen visiting Lucky in his suite. Their testimony hardened Dewey's case against Luciano by implicating him through association with men against whom there was more concrete evidence. Defense lawyers attacked the prosecution witnesses as a collection of unreliable drug addicts and felons, pressured by Dewey into lying to save themselves from prison sentences. Luciano was the victim of the distorted imaginations of broken-down prostitutes, the defense team argued. The attorneys characterized Dewey as a headline-hunting, ruthlessly ambitious prosecutor, a Boy Scout, and a Boy Prosecutor, who manufactured a sensational case against Lucky as a catapult for his own political career.
A questionable defense ploy was an attempt to portray Luciano as a successful gambler and bookie, too wealthy and virtuous to taint himself in the sordid demimonde of prostitution. Lucky took the dangerous step of testifying and matching wits with Dewey. Under gentle questioning by his lawyer, the overconfident witness denied ever meeting the former whores who testified against him, maintained he only knew one of his dozen co-defendants, and had no knowledge of the so-called combine or combination. I give to him, Lucky quipped, when asked if he had ever profited from or was involved in organized prostitution. I never took. Cross-examination proved more hazardous. Having culled confidential police files and gathered from informers every tidbit about Luciano's past, Dewey coolly lacerated Lucky. Pounded by Dewey about contradictions in his testimony, a squirming and perspiring Luciano acknowledged that he might have lied or omitted details in direct examination. He could only weakly muster, I don't know, or I can't remember, to his spate of Dewey's questions about his falsehoods on the witness stand. The prosecutor further undermined Luciano's denials of acquaintance with many of his co-defendants by producing records of telephone calls from his Waldorf Astoria suite to their numbers. Luciano's explanation that someone else probably used his private phone for personal calls must have sounded lame to the jury. Dewey also produced hotel records that phone calls were made to Al Capone, and to a veritable who's-who list of reputed major criminals in the country. Dewey dug up Luciano's tax returns from 1929 to 1935, which showed his highest declared gross annual income was $22,500. Stammering and mumbling, Luciano was unable to explain how he lived like a sultan on his reported income. Probably the most embarrassing moment for the proud Mafia Don was Dewey's disclosure that in 1923, when he was 25, Luciano had evaded a narcotics arrest by informing on a dealer with a larger cache of drugs. You're just a stool pigeon, Dewey belittled him. Isn't that it? I told them what I knew, a downcast Luciano replied, in effect conceding to his peers that he had once violated the code of Omerta. The jury needed only nine hours to deliberate. Luciano listened stolidly as the foreman intoned guilty verdicts on all counts against him and his main co-defendants. For Lucky, it meant a prison sentence of thirty to fifty years. The next year, his appeal was rejected, despite recantations by the three principal witnesses against him. Dewey rebutted the appeal with evidence that the recantations were perjuries, obtained from intimidated or drug-addicted witnesses by Luciano's troops. Overnight, Dewey's triumph magnified him into a national hero. He lectured on the radio and in movie newsreels, the 1930s equivalent of network television, about the dangers of syndicated crime. Hollywood noticed his exploits. The popular movie Marked Woman, based on the Luciano case, opened in 1937, with Humphrey Bogart playing the lead male role, a dynamic D.A. modeled on Dewey. Betty Davis starred as the courageous heroine who risked her life to expose vicious racketeers and their abuse of women. In the movie, the women were portrayed as naive nightclub hostesses, not prostitutes. The courtroom contest with Luciano was undoubtedly a boon to Dewey's political career, almost sending him to the White House. He went on to win elections as D.A. of Manhattan and Governor of New York State, but was unsuccessful as the Republican candidate for the presidency in 1944 and 1948. Lucky Luciano was the only major New York Mafia leader of his era that Dewey or any other prosecutor convicted of a serious felony. The evidence by the three witnesses that tied him directly to the prostitution enterprise was astonishingly thin. Defense lawyers made a monumental blunder by allowing Luciano to testify, thereby opening the door to Dewey's hammering cross-examination about issues that were extraneous to the charges, his criminal past, his lifestyle, and his links to the well-known Al Capone. 
Most mafia and legal scholars who have reviewed the trial record agree that Luciano, as the family boss, profited from the prostitution racket. Yet, in retrospect, they suspect there is a strong possibility that he may have been framed by compliant witnesses with false accusations. These experts believe that as the nation's supreme mafia godfather, he was too important and busy to micromanage the bordello business and allow himself to become implicated in the specific counts leveled against him, aiding and abetting compulsory prostitution. It would have been out of character for the leader of the nation's largest mafia borgata to bother with the minutia of running brothels, as the prosecution asserted. There is, however, indisputable evidence that members of Luciano's crime family established a protection racket, compelling the independent madams and brothel operators to pay a franchise fee to stay open. The correct accusation against Luciano should have been extortion. But Dewey lacked sufficient evidence to pin that more complicated charge on him. Another contemporary big-time boss, Joe Bonanno, who was well-versed in the magnitude of the Mafia's 1930s rackets, was dubious about Dewey's contention that Luciano was a prostitution profiteer. Lucky's earners most likely dropped his name to intimidate whorehouse owners into paying for protection, Bonanno recounted in A Man of Honor. Lastly, Dewey built up a case not so much against Luciano as against Luciano's name, Bonanno pointed out.